Hey there, everyone. Happy Wednesday, May 29th. I'm Dave Keller, and welcome to the final bar. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com. Ooh, in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the market action using the best practices of technical analysis. The S&P 500 has stagnated, has sort of leveled off after gapping higher mid-May. We haven't really made any further upside uh, gains. Even with yesterday's strong rally today, more muted action and a rotation lower in the last hour of trading. What is this doing to the overall thesis? Talking about the market potentially topping, but we haven't seen a breakdown yet. Individual stocks showing some weakness, but plenty of stocks showing strength as well. We have a great guest today, Frank Capillary of Cap Thesis. Going to give a little history lesson about uh, recent market patterns and what sort of things he'll be looking for going into the summer months. With that in mind, let's get to our market recap and focus on what the charts looked at uh, looked like today. Before we get there, we do have a poll that we did recently on the social media platforms, and we asked you which macro factor concerns you the most right now. I would wholeheartedly agree with the 46% of you that say inflation is number one. When you think about what would motivate the Fed to make changes to rate policy, to motivate that first rate cut, to think about how many and how far and how long rate cuts, uh, a rate cut cycle could uh, occur, that's going to be it. Geopolitical issues getting 34% of the uh, of the vote. To be honest with you, it's been limited impact, generally speaking, besides crude oil and some uh, commodities. But again, that could escalate very quickly. There's certainly still a, uh, a, a risk of that. Rising rates really are tied in a lot of ways to inflation, but 11% of you saying there, only 9% of you saying market volatility. Maybe a concern of lack of volatility could be the biggest issue for some of us because uh, the VIX remains fairly low here, still in the, uh, in the low teens. Changing today, though, the VIX actually popping over a full point higher. Uh, so let's look at the market recap, continue on, and look at how some of these charts played out through the course of the day today. The uh, S&P, the Dow, the NASDAQ, all in the red. As a matter of fact, the uh, front page here of our market dashboard, all red except for the VIX, which again uh, pushed higher. The Dow was down over 1% to around 38,442. The S&P 500 down about three quarters of a percent to 52.67. The Nasdaq composite down about 0.6%. Mid cap, small caps both getting dinged as well with the S&P 400 mid cap index, the worst performer, down about 1.3% uh, from uh, yesterday's close. Even the Nasdaq 100, those growth leadership names, the NVIDIA types of names that have done so well. NVIDIA aside, the Nasdaq 100 down 0.7% today. So very much a give back uh, kind of day. No real breakdowns in the major benchmarks, but certainly not showing renewed strength and an appetite for higher highs. The VIX up about 1.4 VIX points to 14.3. This is the highest VIX reading we've seen here uh, in a little while, certainly since the rally in, uh, in uh, April into May. So uh, as we've mentioned many times, I have an alert set for the VIX at 15. I would strongly encourage you to go into your stock charts login because, of course, you're all members. And if not, you very well should be and go in there and set an alert for when, if and when, and it's probably more when the VIX pops above 15. Not that that is the end of the world, you know, this is a disaster scenario type of uh, signal, but it has to, before it can hit 20 or 30 or one of those really disastrous numbers, it has to hit 15 first. So for now, we're still in the low teens, we're in the bottom half of the teens, which is still a low volatility environment. An increased volatility environment usually would mean a, de uh, a, a, a I guess, deceleration or rotation lower in uh, risk assets. Hasn't happened yet, but that would be a warning sign I'd look for. Interest rates all moving higher. So for those of you saying the rising rates were a concern, you're probably not feeling great about the action we've seen in the last couple days. So far in this shortened holiday week, interest rates have been pushing upwards. The 10-year uh, yield finished the day around 462, five-year point around 464, the long bond around 474. The short end of the curve, of course, is still inverted, or I mean, the short end of the curve is still higher uh, meaning a, we have an inverted yield curve, but generally speaking, the 10-year point has pushed higher. The chart of the 10-year yield is, uh, is certainly uh, appearing to be in a fairly consistent uptrend. The dollar actually starting to kind of finally move up a little bit. The UUP, which is a bullish dollar ETF, was up about a half a percent. Dollar index still not quite above 107, which is that level I've been eyeing for uh, quite some time here in 2024, but getting closer, and I think a dollar above 107 could be a concerning development. Commodities actually all in the red. These are the top eight uh, commodity-related ETFs that we track on our platform. The GLD, which is gold, was down 0.9%. Silver down about a quarter of a percent. Copper, crude oil, natural gas, uh, all rotating to the downside. So the commodity-related 
uh, stocks and sectors uh, most likely not doing well today, with some exceptions, but as a uh, generalization. Finally, cryptocurrencies, kind of mixed, but the big ones you're probably most interested in if you're uh, into this space at all, Bitcoin, Ethereum, both down today. Bitcoin is down about 1.6%. We keep threatening to get above 70,000, and when we've done so on Bitcoin, we've not been able to hold uh, above that level. We remain below there, around 67,225, we'll call it, on a Bitcoin Ether prices around 3750. Looking at the 11 S&P sectors, a lot of red today. Your top three performing sectors are the FANG sectors, but they all were down, but not by much, right? The communication services sector, XLC, down about a half a percent. Technology and consumer discretionary, both down about two-thirds of a percent today. On the downside, you have the MEI trade, the uh, value-oriented sectors like energy, industrials, and materials, all down 1.4 to 1.8 percent, with energy the worst performer uh, of the group. It's interesting that even as energy was gapping uh, or trading lower today, Marathon Oil, an earnings name, actually gapped higher, was your top performer in the S&P 500. Uh, but as we'll uh, see as we continue on with some of the charts, that's an outlier of, uh, of sorts. Looking at the growth leadership names, what we call the Magnificent Seven and Friends, only three of them finishing in the green. Netflix and NVIDIA both having another strong update. These are out of this group of eight stocks, certainly, I, I would argue, the strongest. Uh, these are the ones that are actively breaking out, among others. Netflix and NVIDIA both up about 0.8 to 0.9%. On the downside, you have Meta, the worst performer of this group, down 1.2%. Let's go to a daily chart of the S&P 500, see how things played out today and what it meant for the chart of the S&P 500, still holding that support around 5,250. Think about the last uh, you know, couple months of your uh, experience looking at the S&P 500. I think we've established a pretty clear range with 4,950 on the low end. Those are the lows from early to mid-February. Lines up very well with the low from mid-April. On the upside, we have 5,250. That was resistance in March and early April. We then gapped above there, that gap higher a couple of weeks ago uh, after earnings data, or uh, economic data that is, uh, ended up being uh, you know, pretty much the high watermark for the S&P. From there, we've been sideways at best. Today, we're back to the lower end of this range, but still holding that 5,250 level. That 5,250 for me is what we call a tactical line in the sand. That's a level that looks to be important. It's what we call a pivot point that has been tested as support and resistance a couple times here over the last couple months. As long as we hold 5,250, things are just pretty good, if not great. We start to break 5,250, then I think you need to start thinking about further downside support. What levels would you uh, need to see to start to lighten up uh, an equity position? What levels would you need to see to think more about rotating more defensively or actively focusing more on capital preservation than capital growth? I haven't seen enough to make that sort of mental shift just yet. I would say the fact that we made a new all-time high just in the last week tells you all you need to know about the fact that we are still in a primary uptrend. But if we fail to hold 5250, even more so, if we fail to hold trend line and moving average support currently around 5180 to 5200, then I think things are uh, certainly at, at the very least in a pullback phase. 4950, though, that's the lower end of that, uh, of that sideways trend that we've observed here over the last uh, four months since February uh, earlier this year. We hold 49.50 on a pullback, and this is not a corrective move uh, of any substance. We close below 49.50. I think that opens the door to a much further retracement down to the October lows. But first things first, we're still not too far off of those uh, all-time highs. Looking at uh, some breadth conditions here, uh, we're going to talk with my guest today, Frank Capillary, about some of the breadth uh, indicators. I don't want to go too deep into them, but I would just highlight charts like this really give me pause because... What this tells you is from the December 2023 peak to the uh, late March peak to the late May peak, and every one of those times, less and less S&P 500 names have been in an uptrend according to their point figure chart. As a matter of fact, at the end of last year, it was around 80%, over 80% of the S&P stocks. Four out of five S&P stocks in a bullish point and figure chart, which is saying something. The March high, less than that, around 75%. The May high, we're down to around 70%. So every time we've made a new high, there are less and less stocks that are regaining that bullish condition. As a matter of fact, when I scanned for stocks making new swing highs and lows earlier today from my market misbehavior premium members, I found about a five to one ratio of new lows to new highs. So there are a lot of stocks for every NVIDIA just blowing out resistance. Same with that Netflix. There are a bunch of stocks that are breaking down that are in primary downtrends that are part of this story of deteriorating breadth that I don't think is being reflected 
as much as you might think in the uh, performance of our benchmark. To be honest with you, as I was going through my morning coffee routine this morning and going through some of the charts that are of interest to me, one of the things that jumped out was this chart right here. This is a simple relative strength chart, a relative performance chart, looking at the equal weighted S&P versus the cap weighted S&P. So RSP is an equal weighted S&P 500 ETF, and we do a ratio of that equal weighted ETF to the cap weighted version with the same 500 stocks. So what this does is it tells you more about the average stock, right? Sort of the, you know, uh, the general performance of the members of the S&P as opposed to the cap weighted version, which is very, very top heavy NVIDIA, AMD, Microsoft types of, uh, types of names. Look at the long-term decline from the end of 2022. Look at how the equal weighted S&P almost 100% consistently has been underperforming with some notable uh, outliers, like coming off of the uh, November, October, November low last year, uh, the equal weighted version was outperforming because a lot of stocks were doing quite well off of that low. Even uh, you know, our early, uh, late spring, early summer of last year, you saw a bit of outperformance on the equal weighted version. But look at what has happened in the month of May. In February, in March, and April, these two were sort of moving on, in, in line. So you know, the cap weighted and equal weighted versions were kind of doing the same thing, which meant a lot of stocks were doing what the benchmarks were doing. With this line accelerating to the downside over the last four weeks, that tells you something has changed what I like to call a change of character on the chart. This means that it's the biggest names once again dominating the returns and that the average stocks are not looking nearly as good as the S&P is doing. Now, the market, of course, can go up in that sort of environment. Look at 2023. There have been plenty of times when the market was doing just fine, even though this was going down. However, when you go back through multiple cycles, multiple decades, generally speaking, you want the equated version to be doing better for a healthy, expanding bull market phase. And that is not how I would describe what we're seeing right now. Another chart that jumped off uh, at me as I was looking through my morning coffee routine was this one, what I call currencies and commodities. I mentioned that uh, dollar index, which on our platform is dollar sign USD. 107 was the peak in October, November of last year. We almost got there in April. We bought, uh, topped out around 106 and have pulled back yet again. So the general trend in 2024 has been stronger dollar, but we're coming off of a uh, a short-term downtrend from mid-April to mid-May. Last couple of weeks, as we've seen stocks start to sideways move and now rotate lower, you're starting to see the dollar actually pop higher a little bit. And what happens is a stronger dollar, I would say, given the conditions that we're in, given the macro environment, stronger dollar could be a risk asset killer right about now. I think so. It takes me back to 2022 when you had a strong dollar and then pretty much weaker everything else. Um, but I don't know if that uh, same thing would happen, but we're starting to see that sort of pattern emerge. Now, you are so far this week, and again, shortened holiday week, but uh, coming out of the uh, long weekend, you have crude oil prices uh, going a little higher today, uh, pulling back a little bit. Gold prices were up yesterday, pulling back a little bit uh, today. But overall, crude oil above $80 a barrel, pretty, uh, pretty bullish. Uh, gold continuing to establish a higher low and rotating higher would be pretty bullish uh, as well. So at this point, I think signs of encouragement uh, with the technical configurations of these three currency and commodity charts but again, the impact that they may have on risk assets and growth stocks are not to be uh, minimized here. Do want to show you a chart of 10-year yields, interest rates popping back higher and really over the last couple of weeks. Again, think of a change of character. What has been different over the last week or two that has caused the S&P to sort of stagnate and hold right around that 5250 to 5300 level? Rising rates are a big part of that, I would argue. Rates pushing higher from here is not going to be a good thing. Now, before you tell me, well, hold on, aren't rising rates good sometimes? They are, right? And if they talk to, you know, if they speak to economic expansion and rates can go up because things are great and so things can get more expensive and it's not a big deal, that's fine. But that's not the environment we're in right now. We're dealing with a Fed that has not cut rates at all yet uh, after the, uh, the rate hike cycle and now these sort of sideways rate cycle. So higher rates really speak to I would argue, uh, are probably more negative than anything for uh, stocks because they suggest that that starting line uh, for uh, risk cuts, uh, for rate cuts, are going to be pushing a little bit uh, further. And that's so far what we're seeing. 4.7%, by the way, is the peak for the 10-year yield so far in 2024. That was reached uh, third, four week in April. We're not too far below those levels right about now. We'll finish off just looking at a couple names. I want to be a little more macro today as I was going through the market recap. But I do want to highlight a couple individual names to think about. Take Two Interactive, having a decent day. It's always interesting when the market's down to look at which stocks are going up. I would encourage you to go to uh, Charts and Tools 
on, uh, on the top uh, of our uh, platform, go to Market Carpets, which we've recently uh, redesigned and look at the ways you can visualize performance. So here we're looking just at the one day percent change to focus on areas of the market actually showing strength. Uh, and I think finding pockets of green here and don't just look at the one last day, look at the last week, see which stocks are actually thriving in an environment when others are not. You can see that there's a lot of red when we look at the last week, but there's some green on here. Focus on some of those green names and see which stocks within sectors like healthcare and if technology, of course, communication services, even staples and industrials, even materials are actually doing quite well over the last week. See which stocks are getting a bid even though the market is getting dinged. And one of those stocks that would be certainly in the green for the last week, Take-Two Interactive. This is in the communication services sector, uh, you know, video game company. And you can see here, we're just recently breaking above 155. By the way, this stock, Take-Two, is one of the top 10 charts we will be highlighting for June 2024. On Friday of this week, we'll do a special edition of The Final Bar. I was sitting down with Grayson Rose. We'll share with you our top 10 charts to watch for the month of June. Take two is one of those 10, so make sure you don't miss that episode on Friday to catch the other nine. Two other stocks to uh, finish up on. We've got Marathon Oil. I mentioned that at the beginning of our market recap, talking about crude oil prices, commodities coming off. But Marathon Oil, MRO, an earnings name here, is sort of an off-schedule uh, earnings name relative to the rest of the energy space. Gapping higher today, it ended up closing up about 8.4%. That's after selling off through the course of the day today. It finished just below $29 a share. So while that gap higher is encouraging, we're gapping right into overhead resistance. That's what concerns me here. What concerns me more than that is the fact that $80 uh, for crude oil is still above where we're at. So I think crude oil above 80 makes a chart like this seem a lot more interesting than it is today. Southwest Airlines, another one gapping lower. It actually managed to close above the open, which I think is kind of er uh, interesting. We're actually just below that early May low, right around 25.50 to 26. We'd love to see it regain that. But what tells me a lot about this chart is just taking a step back and recognizing the fact that after that gap lower in early March, we have a consistent pattern of lower highs and lower lows. We're below two downward sloping moving averages and the momentum is relatively weak. This is the type of chart I think it's best to just sort of wait it out and see, look for signs of accumulation. When do you see rotation from a distribution phase of selling dominating to an accumulation phase where you have buyers dominating, where you see more signs of accumulation into, uh, into weakness as opposed to further selling for now? I would say a chart like Southwest is heading down and to the right, which is not the right direction. That's it for our market recap. We're going to get to today's guest, Frank Capillary, here in a moment. Before we do so, just a quick reminder, our mailbag could always use a couple more questions, and we would love to hear from you. Anything you're running into as you are trying to analyze the markets using technical analysis, trying to use the stock charts platform, learning different indicators and approaches, we are here to help you along the way. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on X at FinalBarSCTV and here on YouTube. Just drop a comment below the video that you're watching. We'd love to hear from you and hope to answer one of your questions in our next Mailbag show. I want to welcome on today's guest, Frank Capillary. Frank's the founder and president of Cap Thesis, coming to us from uh, New York. Frank, welcome back to the show. We have the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, sort of stagnating after breaking above uh, you know, resistance around 5,300. Take a step back for us. Overall, what's your sense of the conditions here as we wrap up May? Dave, thanks so much for having me. Well, I think the market has proven that it can come back no matter what has got thrown at us over the last few weeks is a good indication of that. But I think what it needs to continue to prove is that we can consolidate in a constructive fashion. And so the, we had the first test of that, of course, after the April pullback. And now because of the slingshot hire was so quick, I, I just think we need to see some more bullish patterns form. And of course, that's what the crux of my analysis is about. And so far, that's playing out as, as good as we can imagine, at least from the October lows. And we seem to see more of that. I would be kind of surprised to see a resumption of the you know extreme uh, advance that we have back then because the market character will change no matter if we're going up or down. So I think a good case scenario right now, just again, some maybe longer term you know, sideways action to get mm. in a construction of some bigger patterns. Yeah, it certainly feels like we've stalled out here. Your, your first chart is an interesting one. I think your first couple charts really showing the contrast between some of the bullish and less bullish patterns that we've seen. The bullish patterns on the S&P, we've had them quite frequently off of the October low, right? That's right. And if I talk about an uptrend, what's the, the main thing that needs to happen for that to occur? You need to see successful bullish patterns. And from that 
angle, that means just you need to see the construction of a formation that you can identify, have a breakout and not have that breakout zone violated, which then allows mm -hmm. the upside target to get hit. And so we had five in a row go through the system from the October low through March. And as you can see from there, you know, there was no backtrack and we know the, the, the pullbacks were very minimal. But toward the end of that, you can tell from that chart, they got smaller. And mm. I was talking about those last two patterns for four and five on a two hour time frame to our clients just because you couldn't really see it as well on a daily chart and just started to tell us that momentum was possibly waning. And you needed to see kind of a reset, like, as we just talked about, where who knows what the pullback was going to look like. Of course, 6% was all we needed from S&P 500 perspective. Mm. But that was enough then to set up the, the, the next iteration, which we have there as number six hitting. And so right now, as you mentioned, above new highs, consolidating. I still have two more patterns we don't have here, but in play. But you just need to see more of the same. And we know technology is leading this, but really what big part of the rally from the beginning was having that rotation. So I think that could, has to be the next step at this stage. The other interesting thing as we go to your second chart is that you know the, we've had potential topping patterns that have certainly looked fairly bearish on the way up, but they've never really materialized or certainly not followed through. That's right, and that is the other part of what uptrends need. Just you need successful bullish patterns and failed bearish patterns. And mm. clearly together, we have uh, the result of that over the last now almost, you know, almost two years worth. And so the way I look at it, you have those four there and maybe two different iterations of it during the fall of last year. And so a lot of times you see these long consolidation uh, formations start to take shape and people want to call you know, the top whether it's from an overbought perspective or something else. But the way I look at it is that you have to see things really materialize in bearish patterns, meaning that momentum has to slow at first. You see a downside break, but then you need to see the acceleration of that where, where sellers really get aggressive and even more so buyers get hesitant. That hasn't been the mm. case right now. And it, it never allow us to pinpoint the top, but trying to do that you know, with traditional indicators all along the way has really proven helpful. As one example, a 14-day RSI for the S&P 500 first got overbought on November 20th, right? And then mm. obviously it didn't matter because we identify what type of market that we're in. And so, you know, at least on a short-term basis even, you need to see some sort of topping pattern actually get a downside target first. And I think once, once that starts to occur, then you can make the case the momentum is finally turning or starting to turn. Right. I love that second chart. One of the founding members of the CMT Association, Mike Epstein, told me before he passed away years ago, there's nothing more bullish than a failed head and shoulders top. And you've, <laughs> we've had a number of those on the way up. I never forget that when I see that on the S&P where it has happened quite often. We have a top heavy issue in the S&P. We have the largest names continuing to do quite well. What does the performance in the Magnificent Seven tell you here about conditions? Well, I think it's an interesting chart because what I was trying to show here is that even though we know they're leading, we know it's been straight up since this magnificent seven ETF is got created the last April, but each one of the breakouts that we saw from May of last year actually got retested, right? Some mm -hmm. of them, again, we didn't, it didn't result in a major inflection point, but it just shows that once people start to recognize this again, once we have the breakouts extend, that's when things start to rotate, or at least some of the of the power of the gas comes off the pedal at that point. So right now, as we know, the last push higher, led by semis and Nvidia, so forth and so on, has created another breakout, which has not been tested yet. Mm. And so I think there is a case to be made that that's going to happen. And if you go down to the second part of that chart, the, the, the bottom panel, now, what this has done is create another new all-time high on a relative basis versus the S&P 500, so much so that now that, that line, the relative line is above an uh, upper sloping channel that has confined all the action up to this mm. point. So it begs the question is, if and when that happens, if a bid finally wanes and does not and comes out of the MAG7, does it cause all those big names, all the influential names to catch down to things that are, are starting to roll over right now? Or is there another suggestion of the real chance for rotation to take hold? That's, mm. that's the big question. Yeah, yeah, no, no, very, very interesting. Now, the other side of that, obviously, breadth conditions have started to really deteriorate. We've covered this on the show a little bit uh, here recently. Does that concern you about the conditions here going into June? Yes, and that's part of it. So we know that, I think, in particular, on the bottom of that chart, looking at the percentage of stocks above their 20-day, 
And so that's why we have those blue lines to signify potential trading lows. So at the time, we noticed that the number of S&P 500 stocks uh, trading above their 20 dipped below 10%. And that had lined up with the least bouncing opportunities along the way mm. over the last few years. So now that you know created a bounce. But now, as we can see from all those lines, there's been negative divergences, right? Lower highs as S&P was making higher highs. And again, we know the reason why bigger names are leading. But now we're getting, getting to the point where that percentage of, of stocks above the 20 is getting down back down to almost extremes again on the other side. And that could be the reason why we could see rotation come back in when the bigger names start to pull back again. So if we talk about rotation of some of these leading names, the NVIDIAs, the AI trade, if that starts to rotate, where do you see rotation opportunities? Right? Where should we be looking for new opportunities going into, uh, I guess, continuing on in Q2? Well, I think the best area, of course, would be something like the industrials one because they're the, they're the most components within the S&P 500. And because of that fact, you need something that has a little more meat, right? Have a little mm. more weight to it. Now, you and I were talking, Dave, as well about energy. I think that is an important one as well because it may not seem like it, but it's not the worst performing sector of the year, right? It's actually, it was up about 8% or so last I checked year to day, and that was even after today's action, which makes it right in the middle of the pack there, not too far behind. So that's not going to you know cause the market to do well, but I think that that's one area that people aren't looking for as a spot to actually lead like it has or like it did in the past. But some of those names are still relatively buoyant and I would not ignore them going forward. When you think about this market obviously stalling out, we've had the largest names really keeping uh, some strength, which is I think allowing the benchmarks to remain strong. If we, I guess, don't get a rotation to some of those value plays like energy and industrials, what would you see that would turn you a little more negative at the market? Like what, what would tell you, okay, this is not just a pullback, this is time to get defensive. Is it an improvement in some of the defensive sectors, things like utilities that have cooled off a bit? Where would you look for a, a warning sign, I guess? I, I think it's probably have to look outside of equities, right? Mm. And as we know, 10-year yield in, in US dollars have been extremely good guides, if nothing else. And what's been different in 2024, at least the beginning stages of it, is that those really didn't hadn't pulled back, right? And to the point where we would think they would have based on what the S&P has done. I think one of the reasons for that is even though we saw rallies in the dollar and yield, those were not really too strong. And so, you know, levels are one thing with other asset classes, but the market just does not like things happening too fast. And that mm -hmm. was one of the major reasons why 2022 happened the way it did. I think you know, over time, market can accept change and, and theme changes, but does not want to see it all at once. So from, from that angle, if we start to see the dollar regain steam and somehow blast through, a, which is now a two-year trading range above 107, I think that would tell us that things are changing uh, for the negative for risky assets. We only have about a minute left, Frank, but I'd love to ask you about the seasonal tendencies, right? The last five years, we've had a major top in the summer. We're sort of getting closer and closer to that time where We've had a top. What sort of charts, what tools would you use to gauge whether that summer top is going to happen again in 2024? What's your go-to look to try to navigate that sort of uh, momentum? Well, I think seasonality has been interesting this year because it really hasn't played out as we thought it would, right? A market outperformed in the first two months of the year, now doing better than, you, than we thought it would in May. But overall, I'm always losing you know, patterns as my, the first thing I, I look toward and the last. And right mm. now, if that changes, that's going to tell me it's, uh, you know, the environment could potentially change as well. One, on top of that, one of the reasons why bullish patterns work so much is that you typically have the low two-way volatility. And the way I look at that is uh, a fewer amount of 1% moves on either side. That's been relatively tame as well. If we start to see motion come back in, whether it's big gains or losses, that could tell us that, you know, motion is coming back in and that, obviously causes volatility. And I think that could cause you know, a top as we were talking about. Mm, great thoughts there. Appreciate that, particularly on the uh, volatility conditions remaining relatively tame here. Frank, this was awesome. Thanks so much for sharing a little uh, market history lesson, going through some of the dynamics you're seeing. Thanks for coming on the show. And we'll look forward to uh, doing it again soon. Dave, thanks so much. I look forward to it. That's Frank Capillary. Frank's the founder and president of Cap Thesis, a fellow CNBC contributor. We joined uh, earlier this year together, which is uh, pretty awesome. 
I love those first two charts that uh, Frank was showing, looking at you know, the bullish patterns, the continuation patterns, those signs of additional accumulation, recognizing that buyers are dominating a pushing price higher, demand is outweighing supply, but also don't discount the benefits of recognizing when bearish patterns don't really follow through, when stocks look to break down but don't and remain strong. That tells you about the overall market conditions there. Great take, uh, as always, by Frank Capillary of uh, Cap Thesis. Got to wrap the show, folks. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Again, a special thank you to Frank Capillary of Cap Thesis joining us from New York. For Stock Charts and Rev in Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.